Mohammed, how this has kind of played out, the idea that we're so focused on the details, I don't think the market's going to sway anything from that, but that's also because I think the Fed did it the right way and got the statement out there. Yeah, it's really important that this happened this week and not last week, no. because had it happened before, <laughs> before the pivot, we would be having a completely different conversation. Right. Having said that, I think, as Steve said, this is normal. It's happened before, and I think it's important. I always feel it's important for two sides to hear each other, and it reduces, doesn't eliminate, but reduces the probability of misunderstanding in the future. So I think, you know, net-net, this is neutral to slightly favorable to the market, but it's not a big deal. So what, what is a big deal to the markets right now? If we've got the Fed essentially on hold for the next six months, um, there are all kinds of other things to distract the market, but earnings have, have been the one focus that we've seen kind of so far. What do you think about what's so going I, First, I think last week was a big deal. Yeah. Okay, because I think of distributions, and whether you look at the distribution of expected returns or the distribution of volatility, what the Fed did is it reduced the left tail. That's what it did. It didn't guarantee the right tail, everything, everything going well, but it reduced the left tail, which means the expected return goes up, vol expected volatility comes down. When you say left tail, you mean the possibility it will make a mistake, tighten yeah, too sure. much? No. I just want to know. Am, am I wrong about what left you Left tail for the markets, that they do not feel that they've got responsive liquidity behind them, and the left tail for the market in feeling that they have to sell every rally. I think that that's what the Fed did. It played on expectations that liquidity would be accommodated if needed and therefore you can be more comfortable going back to the old view that yeah look at dips as perhaps buying opportunities so that's really important now what's important is the white tail depends on things that the fed does not control it depends mainly on growth in europe and china and we got some pretty concerning pmi numbers again today out of Italy, out of the UK. So, so it's important to, to understand what the Fed does and what the Fed doesn't do. Reduces left tail, doesn't increase the right tail, and, and that's really important. We, we had a, a guest who joined us a little earlier who, who was just pointing out that our nation and the North American region is much more isolated from the rest of the globe in terms of trading, in terms of where we used to be, how the economy there may or may not impact us. Do you think that's a, a correct assumption? He, he pointed out that the the Asian nations have been trading a lot more with each other over the last 20 years or so. And that's why they were a little more isolated from the financial, the Great Recession that we dealt with here, that it didn't wash up as much on their shores. Can we say the same, that their problems won't necessarily wash up on our shores? So certainly what happens in the U.S. is mainly a function of the U.S. We are a relatively closed economy. We are much more flexible and agile than the rest of the world. But our companies sell abroad. Right? Our company has got a lot of the profits abroad. So I think you have to make the distinction between the economy, which I think is market. relatively isolated, and the market. Mohammed, would you take our CNBC Fed survey live on air here? <laughs> Let's go. When is the next, the next move of the Fed? Will be A, to tighten policy, or B, to loosen policy? I suspect it will be to do nothing this year. And all year. All year. Zeros all year. Probably, and next year will more likely to be loosen than so tight. So next tight, and when will that? When will this cut come? Sometime next year. And what probability do you put on that cut happening? Call it 50, 55 percent. Okay, on the balance sheet. Right. Um, will the Federal Reserve alter its current plan to reduce the balance sheet this year by up to six hundred billion dollars? It certainly will go off autopilot. It certainly will. So go we'll off. alter it. Yes. It will alter it, and we, it will alter both the notion of the destination. And the pace okay, that's the next question. You're jumping the gun on me, Mohammed. What is the total? The current balance sheet is $4 trillion. Where will the Fed get there and when will it get there? It's data dependent. Well, give me a number. No, no it's data why dependent. Why not? Be you're, like, you're like Powell. Because these numbers are meaningless. The, the balance sheet is one of other tools. So, so you've got to, it, it's going to solve simultaneously. It's not going to solve, oh, this is fixed. Or, this is what the Fed has learned. You're giving me a multivariate cannot, equation is what you're doing. Yeah, the, the, what, what has the Fed learned? You don't do that on cable. Painfully, is that there was a time when autopilot was the right signal to give to the markets. Right. But there's, this is the time to give the signal to the market that all its policy tools are in play. That's what the market wants to hear, that the Fed is responsive and has a range of policy tools. All right, last question in the survey. Grade Powell. A, B, C, D, E, hmm. A, B, C, D, or F? A. You give him an A. I'll give him an A, yeah. Because? Because I think that anybody would have had enormous challenges navigating this environment. 
It's a very fluid environment. It's incredibly fluid. And they're learning as they go along. So this but, is interesting because there's, a, there's a, you know, the two main I ideas of theories of history, which is the great man or woman theory or the great right. times theory. And, and, and the question was whether or not Powell was the right person for the job or whether or not, you know, the times dictated what he does. And I, I, I kind of like your explanation. Uh, he, he had um, the, the next hundred basis points was a lot harder than the first one. And the balance sheet was OK on autopilot for a while until it wasn't. And then he was faced with a choice. I'm not sure he blew it as much as he was forced to react. And also the most difficult environment to navigate is when economic prospects around the world are no longer correlated. When huh. they are divergent, which is what's, what's the case now, that is a very difficult environment to navigate if you're a policymaker. And that is what he has inherited. This, he didn't create this, he inherited it. And you say right now he's fostered this idea that investors don't have to sell rallies. Because there was this idea that, okay, fine, if, if the S&P goes up to 2,800 again, uh, and all of a sudden financial conditions are no longer tight, the Fed is back in play this year. You don't think that's the case? No, I think he, he fundamentally changed psychology. I think he changed it in a negative way initially when they signaled two things. I first signaling four rate hikes for last year, I said at the time that was a mistake, and signal and repeating and repeating autopilot, that told markets no longer buy every dip, but think about selling rallies. Mm -hmm. And now we've had a correction. Uh, have we asked Mohammed if he's going to be a Fed, no, the Fed governor? 